Dom Clays. I'm president of the Santa Monica Conservancy, and I want to thank you for joining us this afternoon for the first of three fall lectures. Some of you are familiar with the Conservancy's mission. For, for, for those of you that are not, the Conservancy is a historic preservation organization, much like the LA Conservancy or the National Trust for Historic Preservation. We're an educational and advocacy group that focuses on Santa Monica and the immediately surrounding area. Through our efforts for the last 18 years, we have become the leading voice in the community for embracing historic preservation and adaptive reuse while celebrating our historic communities and their memories. We want to thank our sponsor, Red Car, and Jim Jacobson, its owner, for making this fall lecture series possible. Red Car is a local firm that invests in urban real estate in Los Angeles, specializing in adaptive reuse and redevelopment with a commitment to sustainable, ethical, and responsible investment. Now I'll turn it over to Libby Motika to start our program. Welcome to the first lecture in our series on the people and communities who settled in this area and whose history and culture have contributed an important piece to the mosaic that we now call Santa Monica. We begin at the beginning with the indigenous group, the Tongva Gabriolino, that settled this area uh, as far back as 10,000 years ago. Our speaker, Desiree Martinez, will talk on the history of the tribe and highlight the heritage and culture that surrounds us and continues to contribute to the region today. After Martinez has dedicated her life to obtaining the skills and knowledge to combat the destruction of Native American sacred and historic sites, including that of her own tribe, the Tongva Gabrielino. Martinez holds a BA in anthropology from the University of Pennsylvania and an MA in anthropology from Harvard. She is the president of Cogstone Research Re Resource Management, and she's the co-director of the Pima Catalina Island Archaeology Project. After Martinez's talk, we invite you to ask questions, which you can do by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we will, uh, we will continue, conclude her program with this with 15 minute question and answer period. And now I present Desiree Martinez. Hello all, thank you for coming and joining um, me tonight. And I'd like to thank the Santa Monica Conservancy for inviting me here to talk about the history of my community. And I hope that the information that I will provide to you will um, let you better understand the history and the item, uh, the history of the Gabrielino Tonga and the contributions that we've made to the development of, the, of Los Angeles as well as to Santa Monica. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So one of the things that I wanted to start off with was the reason was the reason why I became an archaeologist. And a lot of it had to do with because as I was growing up in the Los Angeles area, um, we were being told that we were extinct. We were no longer a tribe. And we had a lot of community members that were out there working on development projects, talking to archaeologists and archaeologists telling them that there were no significant sites or the sites were destroyed or that we didn't exist. And so in talking with a community member, um, Chief Sarah Rocha, uh, Vera Rocha, um, in telling her about what I wanted to do in terms of protecting archaeological sites, she told me that we needed a Gabrielino archaeologist, that we needed somebody from the community who understood archaeology, could talk the talk of archaeology. And so from that point on, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And that's my, my background to that. And so who are the Tongva? And one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that we are not extinct, that we are still a vibrant community. We live all over the United States, um, as well as um, here in Los Angeles County. And uh, we continue to, to, to live amongst everybody here. There are currently six different bands of Gabrielino Tongva people, each community um, has their own unique name and um, areas in which they're interested in in terms of protection. And like I stated, most of the 
the Tongva live all over the world. I have family in Montana. We have people that live in other um, countries as well. But our traditional homelands, as, um, as shown here on the map, is the Los Angeles Basin, as well as parts of Orange County, Riverside County, San Bernardino County, as well as the four Southern Channel Islands of San Clemente, San Nicolas, Santa Barbara, and Santa Catalina Island, which is where I actually do a lot of my personal work. Um, this map is showing some of the villages that were actually recorded at the time of contact. Um, most of how uh, the Gabilan Tongva lived in the past had to deal with various villages that were within Tongva territory, and some of those villages were actually at a crossroads um, between the borders of various um, communities that include. So, for instance, in Malibu, um, it was actually inhabited by both Chumash, um, Tongva, as well as Tataviam people. And of course, there is not, um, there were many more villages than are documented here. These are the ones that were documented by a lot of the ethnographers during the time, um, during the historic period, as well as archeologists. And so one of the important things that many of you may have been um, hearing for the past couple of years is what did the Tongva ancestors call themselves? And, you know, one of the big things in terms of what our ancestors, how our, our ancestors identify themselves is, the short answer, we don't know. But we do know, particularly at contact, a lot of um, the Tongva ancestors would identify themselves by the village that they lived in. And um, so if you were to be, introduce yourself to somebody, you would say you were a person from that particular village. And a lot of what we're now doing, particularly in terms to decolonize the way that our history is being presented to the general public is to um, create a term and use a term that we can use in order to talk about all of those ancestors from all of those different villages that I just showed you. And so we've been using the term Tongva as that catch-all term. And so this um, slide here kind of breaks down um, how we name our villages or identify ourselves as uh, from a particular village. So the com village community is Yar, um, and, I'm, and the people that are um, from Yar, the village, is uh, Yavet, and the name of the village is Yagna. So a lot of you may know the term Yagna and have heard about it, and that is a village that was within the area of downtown Los Angeles. And so people that are from um, Yar are Yavetam. And sometimes you'll see a V, sometimes you'll see a, a B, and that has a lot to do with um, different dialects and stuff like that. Um, so in actuality, if you look around Los Angeles County, there are a number of place names that still have those Tongva names attached to them. And that happens to be Topanga, Tahunga, Coanga, Kukamungna, Hoikoima, and Azusa. Hoikoima and Azusa, their endings have changed over time. But if you see any of time you see that ending of NGA, that means that it's a Tongva place name. Um, and also, for those of you that live in Santa Monica or have been down by Santa Monica, you might have seen a street called Momadahiko, and that is actually a street name that was applied uh, to that street in 2004 in honor of our boat or red plank canoe that we um, have been using in order to reestablish and revitalize our maritime traditions. Momadahiko means breath of the ocean, and that's the name of our boat, and so the picture that you see here is our Momadahiko that we um, put into the water on Santa Monica Beach um, during the World Festival of Sacred Music back in 2008. Um, so I had mentioned that we're, uh, the Tonga are trying to create um, or are using a term in which to call um, ourselves today. A lot of um, in the past we've been identified, or should I say Indians, that were associated with a mission in California were called a particular term based on the mission that they were from. So all of the Indians that were from San Gabriel were called Gabrieleno, um, spelled variously. Um, those from San Juan Capistrano are called Juan Año. Those from San Fernando Mission were Fernandeño. And all of these um, different missions through time actually had different groups of different Native American tribes in that place at one time or another. So if you look at the historical record, even though a person maybe have been called Gabrieleno in the past, they could have been from another community that wasn't Tongva, they could have been Kawia, they could have been Luiseno. It just depends on um, uh, the history of that, that community. A lot of um, 
and I can explain later about what happened during the mission, the mission period. Um, so the word Tongva actually comes from and was used by a woman whose name was Narcisa Rosemeyer, and she was interviewed by an ethnographer in the early 1900s, and she identified, um, she was asked, what are the people of this area called? At the time, she was being interviewed at Fort Tahome, but they were talking about the Los Angeles homelands, and she used the word Tongva. And the word Tongva is based on the base word Tovar, which means mother, earth, world, or land, with To um, meaning earth, the NG, if you remember, in place of, and then va from. So we're people of the earth, people of the land. And so because this was a term that was identified by a, um, an ancestor of our community, this is the term that we're using to, to identify all of the peoples within the Los Angeles basin and the Channel Islands, which I um, explained to before. Um, there never was one overarching term to identify all of those peoples in Tongva homelands. Like I said, they use the, the term to identify themselves based on the village that they were from. But again, because we want to make, stop using um, the historic terms that we were identified with, Gabrielino or Fernandinho, for instance, um, we're using Tongva as that catch-all term. So what a lot of people may not know or may have heard when they've been hearing about the Gabrielino Tongva um, is that we actually emerged from the earth. We emerged at Pavona, and Pavona is a very special sacred spot for us, and parts of it are located um, down on Cal State Long Beach, and on the, um, the right-hand side, uh, there's what our, our spot looks now, and then there's a historic picture of um, Cal State Long Beach as well as Rancho Los Alamitos, which is also um, identified as being part of Pavona. And um, archaeological history states that the ancestors of the Gabrielino Tongva didn't come into the Los Angeles Basin until about 4,000 BP. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of that has been continued to be um, spoken about by archaeologists, when in fact that goes contrary to what our oral history states. In our oral history state that we came from Pavonga, we have always been here since time immemorial. Um, it becomes very important to make sure that we are challenging the archaeological record because a lot of that um, interpretation is based on linguistics and based on changes in the material culture. But as an archaeologist, if you actually look at all of the, the, the sites through time from 10,000 years ago and on, you see small changes in technology, small changes in settlement patterns. Um, through time, so you see that there's in place, you know, evolution of a community, whereas if we had come from, as some people state, the Great Basin or somewhere north or, or to the east of us, they would have lived on the land differently and they would have brought those tools and ways of living and settlement patterns to this area and they would have kicked out whoever was here. You just don't see that in the archaeological record. Um, and so a lot of what I do along with um, people who participate and re um, do research with me out on Catalina Island, we're changing that narrative. We've been here and we want to make sure that everybody knows that. And so basically the Gabrielino Tongva in the past, like I said, was everything was village based. There was a leader, a Tomar, who was in charge of making sure that the second Secular religious life calendars were in sync and that making sure that everything that needed to happen in order for the, the village to continue um, were um, kept on going. Each village had a few lineages of nuclear families. So if you think about you, your mom and your dad, their brothers and sisters, um, and then your cousins, so your grandmother and their brothers and sisters and all their families, um, that's what we would consider a village um, of related people who were tied to a common ancestor. Um, and then most of these villages could range anywhere between 500, uh, 50 to 500 people, just depending on the season, um, what ceremonial activities might be um, happening, as well as where on the landscape they were living. Um, so if you happen to be in an area that was plentiful in terms of resources, you could support a larger population, whereas if you were living on the edges, think of Rancho Cucamonga, 
where they're, you know, you're in a desert type environment, not a lot of water, then your village is going to be a much, uh, much smaller. And like I said, all of these villages were um, standalone. Nobody was, there wasn't one overarching leader over all of the villages. Each village had their own leader. But sometimes these villages um, would come together again for ceremony or for gathering um, in, in harvesting the acorns, for instance, or other resources in which a number of different um, people needed to come together um, in order to, to make sure they got enough food for everybody. But what's really important about um, the, the Gavilano um, community is that we were really tied to the communities throughout Southern California. And this map shown here um, that was put together by Chester King based on the mission records of both baptismal, marriage, and death records um, is that the Gavilano people had a lot of relationships with people, uh, with all of the different villages and communities the Tatavium, the, the Chumash, as well as the Serrano. And the thicker the lines, the more connections or marriages between particular villages. So if you happen to see down uh, one of these thick lines down here on the bottom, there's a huge connection between Pimu, which is Catalina Island, and Gashpet, which is in the Bologna wetland. Um, and so the reason why there was these connections was because of the intermarriages and a lot of these intermarriages occurred so that in times of famine or in times of stress that you could then go um, to your kinsman's village and say, hey, I need help. Um, and then in some instances that village would help with various resources um, and we uh, use those connections also in order to um, complete ceremony. You would have dancers and singers uh, present at the ceremony. And so any time that a village would, would have a ceremony um, there, then they would share whatever resources they had to distribute, um, not only to um, the people that were hired to dance and perform the ceremony, but also those people that were actually happened to be guests. And so when people start talking about how we're so connected globally in terms of um, the internet as well as trade and stuff like that, um, we've always been connected with the community around us. And we actually not only had um, connections through marriage, had connections through ceremony, but we also had con connections through um, training and exchanging items that were um, in our territory with other people. So on the right-hand side, I have a, a little table that was put together by Lowell Bean in a document where he was tracing what was going um, were going out of Tongva territory and what was coming in. And so we see that from Gavrilino territory, we have steatite or what's known as soapstone, abalone shell, olivella beads, dry fish. That was all going east out to as far as the Gila River, out to the Pimas people. Um, and we were getting, uh, particularly out on Catalina, because Catalina, um, this largest mammal, um, is the fo island fox. So we were getting deer meat, acorns, obsidian, and shirt out to Catalina. Um, and so in order to, you know, continue on and, and um, solidify the relationships, you had a lot of trade and exchange going on. And then, of course, our system from the west over to Pima then connected to this larger trade and exchange system that crisscrossed the western United States and into the Midwest. So we actually have documentation of shell, um, uh, square shell beads going up all the way to Oregon, um, as well as items um, coming up from Mexico. Um, and from the Southwest, we have pottery that we found um, in archeological sites as well. So we had lots of goods coming from other native people from around the country. Um, and unfortunately, we had the colonization of Tonga land. And um, at contact, particularly at, um, in 1771, you had the Spanish that were um, coming into Alta California, and a lot of it um, was done because they wanted to protect their trade relationship um, between Acapulco and um, the Philippines in Manila. And so in order to make sure that those ships would go back to Spain in one piece, they needed some place to stop off and refuel, get more food and resources um, so that those um, boats can make a journey. And so 
they looked at Alta California as that pit stop. And so because of that, you had the Spanish starting to bring in settlers, um, establish missions to divert the Indians because ultimately they wanted and saw the, the native people of the land as the laborers that were going to collect these resources. They were going to tend to the cattle and the pigs. They were going to create the candles. They were going to be doing all of the labor in order to then feed and supply those ships. And then as the settlers coming in, feed and supply the settlers and ultimately um, actually build the buildings. A lot of people don't realize, particularly in the Pueblo of Los Angeles, when it does get established in 1780, is that it was Tongva ancestors who actually made the buildings and built the buildings. They dug the ditches for the Zanha, which is the system of water that was running through the area. And it was because of, of the ancestors that Los Angeles got its start. Um, and unfortunately, as many, um, which is contrary to the, the story that was put out um, by the Spanish um, missionaries and then by the Catholic Church of the history, there was ill treatment of the Gabriela and Tongva ancestors and um, forced labor, in some instances starvation, um, if they didn't um, participate in their uh, labor or anything like that. And so there was actually a revolt by, by Torquina, who was a chief's daughter in 1785, um, and she was going to lead everybody, all of the um, Indians in the mission, out um, from the mission. Unfortunately, she was um, a spy, was told on her, and she was captured, and she actually was then sent um, up north and ended up marrying a Spanish soldier. Um, so it was not a good thing to be in the missions. Um, so even after that, after that attempt at revolt, um, you did have people that escaped, um, but basically the Gabriel Tonga continued to be the major labor force um, in Los Angeles until the, the, the missions were, were secularized. <clears throat> in order to reward all of the soldiers and all of the various people, um, both that were, um, under the Spanish crown and then in um, the Mexican times when uh, Mexico gains independence from Spain and takes over all of the, the Spanish um, colonial properties, you had um, pieces of land that were given to those people who were loyal. Um, and here this map actually shows some of those um, early grants. And I circled here um, Boca de Santa Monica, which covers part of um, the city of Santa Monica. I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, that grant there. Um, and so once the missions become secularized, basically they are no longer under the control of the church. Everybody that was in the mission pretty much scatters. And you had people who had been born in the mission and didn't understand and know, um, didn't have a place to go. And so you had um, some Tongva people who stayed in the city or moved to the city of Los Angeles and continued to be workers or some of them actually flee into the interior. We have people documented going all the way to where Morongo is and, and living with family in Morongo or living with family down in Lewis Indian territory. Um, for those people that stayed in Los Angeles because they had nowhere to go, they actually, um, there was a village in which was only, was comprised of Tonga people. Um, and it moved from time to time over the years in downtown Los Angeles with is because as Los Angeles was growing, they didn't like that the Indians were in the Zanha washing themselves and they didn't like the smell of them or they didn't, they thought that they lived a filthy life. And so there's a whole bunch of ordinances in Los Angeles to deal with the Indian problem. And it was not just um, Tonga people, but it was a lot of other mission Indians as well because we have um, documenta um, documentation of Serrano people coming in as well as Los Angeles people coming in and they're looking for work and looking for money. And so one of these ordinances um, that Los Angeles enacted is basically a vagrancy law that if there was any Native American that was found drunk within the downtown Los Angeles area during the week, they would be thrown into jail. And you couldn't get out of jail unless you paid the bail. And so what would end up happening is you had local ranchers and um, that would come into the city and they would basically pay the bail or whatever fee um, uh, that was held against the, the Tongva person and take them out and the law stated that the person who took them out would have to feed them and care for them and so they would take that person to work off their debt to their ranch and once they worked off their debt 
in the ranch, they would, instead of paying them in money, they would pay them in alcohol. And so then the native person would go back to Los Angeles and then would drink, become drunk, and then get caught again, thrown into jail. And it was a never ending cycle of native people being used um, because of all of the different laws that were um, enacted against them. There was pretty much almost like a slave market where you would um, have in the plaza area, the officials bringing out Tonga people and in having people bid on them and, and, and pay for them to, to, to come to the ranch and work on those, um, on those ranches and stuff like that. And like I said, there was one village called the Puerlito, particularly in 1854 to 18, uh, 1845 to 1847, that was on the edge on the other side of the river. They, that was the last spot where they, they had identified Tongva people in the historic record. And then after that, um, the village was actually raised. And we don't know, in particular, the people that were living in that Pueblito, where they went. Um, but you did have um, a lot of Native people at the time as well, pretending to be, um, because they're actually, um, because once California became a state uh, in 1850, and California needed a deal with all of these roaming mission Indians, they decided that they were going to start to um, put some treaties together in order to kind of push Native people out of, out of major areas where a lot of the new settlers wanted to settle. Um, so that they would be out of the way. And so there were 18 treaties that were um, put together during 1851 to 1852 um, by three commissioners that were appointed. However, the Tongva were never actually a part of any of these treaties. None of our leaders ever signed. Um, and in actuality, when you look at the historic record, you see that the commissioners specifically state that they were told not to talk to or not to um, sign a treaty with the Tongva because they were the, the force, they were the labor force for a lot of the ranchers in the Los Angeles area. And we were the good Indians because we weren't causing trouble. And you also had a lot of um, Gavilan Tongva taking on identities in order to hide um, from authorities. Particularly in California, there was laws that were passed that, uh, that, had that provided bounties on the heads of Indian people. So if you had somebody that brought in a scalp of a native person or the head of a native person, they would actually get money. That was a way to solve the Indian problem. So a lot of Tongva community members actually took on Mexican, -Amer Mexican and then Mexican American identities in order to hide in plain sight and be good and not, um, not identify themselves to um, the various communities that they lived within. So now I want to talk about a village, one of the villages that's actually um, within Santa Monica Canyon, and it's called um, Comicrana. And I have a video here from Craig, a uh, sound file here from Craig Torres, who's a descendant of the people of this village. Um, so you can hear him. Hopefully, you'll be able to hear it. You can hear him pronounce the village better than me. So for those people that are Facebook savvy or on the internet, there's actually um, a Facebook page that gives the Tongva word of the day. And this happened to be one of the Tongva words of the day about four years ago. So if you're interested, you can always go there. Pam Moreau, who's a linguistic, uh, linguist at UCLA, who's been helping the Gavilano Tongva revitalize our language, um, is in charge of that website. And so on SoundCloud, there's a whole bunch of different audios where you can learn how to pronounce various Tongva terms. But um, Kominglana village is what we think is in Santa, Santa Monica Hannon around um, Marquez Cemetery, if you guys can, um, who are familiar with the area know where that's at. And it's actually one of the last villages that get um, put into the San Gabriel system. And that's based on uh, both um, marriage and baptismal certificates. And it, it's because it happens to be out of the reach of, of, of the mission in San Gabriel. And there are actually famous Comica uh, Vetham. So remember, Vetham is people of um, from this particular village, one of them being Victoria Reed. And so some people may have heard her name or her husband, whose name um, is Hugo Reed, who published The Indians of Los Angeles, which was the first account um, or gathering of information about the um, Tongva ancestors. And she was the daughter of a very famous um, community leader. And she was one of 
few women that actually obtained a grant, 108 acres um, to a rancho, and that's actually near where present day um, San Marino is. And then Hugo Greed, of course, gets the Santa Anita Ranch. Um, and then they end up getting lost. Um, or should I say, he, uh, Hugo Reed has to sell his ranch um, in order to survive because he was within, um, almost bankrupt. Prospero Dominguez is another um, uh, person from the village and he also got a Mexican um, uh, land grant in the area of San Gabriel and it was about 23 acres. It was very rare for Native people to get land grants in California, although the treaty between um, Los Angeles and Mexico specifically stated and the, the fathers at the mission had always hoped to make Native Americans in California basically peasants and have their own land. Um, the land should have been distributed to all of the mission Indians at the, you know, at the various missions and stuff and that never happened. Instead, those lands, particularly when California becomes a state, get claimed by a lot of outsiders, um, either um, uh, Americans who had taken on Mexican um, citizenship, they lay claim, um, or other scrupulous people. And unfortunately, as what happens is even though both Victoria Reed and Prospero get their land, get some bit of their traditional lands, um, they end up getting dispossessed either by shenanigans um, where uh, uh, various agreements are kind of given to them and, and basically being lied to and stuff like that. Um, and so uh, Comigna is just one of the villages that are um, important to us and we're just, and Craig is, um, Torres is in the process of really developing a good history regarding um, that and particularly um, talking about his ancestors. But um, uh, many of the Tonga leaders um, have been working with UCLA in order to document our, our special sp places. And if you go to um, Mapping Indigenous LA, we have a whole section on various places that mean a lot to us. And one of those places, like I mentioned before, is I do a lot of my research on, on Pima or Catalina Island. And so there is um, within this map that UCLA has developed in conjunction with the, the Tonga Territory, we talk about why things, why these places are so special to us. So for Pimu, um, not only do the Tongva um, look at Pimu as being sacred, but a lot of other Southern California Indians see Pimu as being sacred as well. Um, and so in our oral histories, Pimu is seen as the place of, um, of, the, of the, the, the people who have the medicine, the people who are strong and that they can do things for you. So if you wanted you know, to smite your enemy, for instance, or something like that, you would actually go to the people that were living on, on Pimu and then um, you know, whatever you asked for would be done. And there's actually a, an oral history story that we have of um, a chief of one of the communities who went to Catalina and, and, and talked to the, um, one of the medicine people there and asked that this particular village be wiped out. And um, basically the, the medicine person told him, you know, are you sure? And he said, yes. And so he goes back home and he finds out that that particular village, his enemy village had been wiped out, but it turned out that his daughter had actually married the son of, of somebody from that village. And so that's kind of the story of, you know, be careful of what you wish for um, in our communities, that you never know if you do something, what the ramifications might be um, in the, um, might, might be to you or um, to anybody in the future. There's other um, resources that are available. Um, to visit one of, and if you ever have the chance, um, another one of our sacred sites, which is open to the public, is Caravana Springs, which is on the campus of University High School, which is in um, the West LA. And this is um, pictures of, of me and some of our community members after a training that we did for UCLA, or not UCLA, Los Angeles School District teachers. Um, and that's actually a spring that was visited um, in the past. Um, supposedly by Father Sarah, but has always been a very important spot to us. It's one of the few springs that are actually in Los Angeles. And then one of our traditional, uh, one of our elders, uh, Julia Bogany, has created a website called To Be Visible. Um, and the um, website is down uh, at the bottom. And she's created a map along with some of her students of particular places 
um, that mention Tongva history, either they have exhibits or they have plaques. And so all of those sun um, icons that you see on that map are places that you could visit that are public um, that you can go visit. Um, and so if you go to that map and you click on that, it'll show you where those, those places are. And then also on her, her website, she um, put together a book called Tongva Women Inspiring the Future. And it's an actually really wonderful book, more toward elementary school kids talking about our famous female leaders. A lot of times the history really focuses on male, um, males being the leaders within a particular community. And so again, to try to um, turn the tides, we had a lot of famous uh, female um, community members who played a big history a big part in our history and that is, so this book actually talks about Victoria Reed it also talks about all um uh Toy Karina as well as uh, other strong Tongva women that have been part of our history and so um I just want to thank you for listening to me and, and again you know our history is deep runs deep in Los Angeles and runs deep in Southern California and there this is just a brief introduction to the history of our community um, and I hope that you will be able to enjoy some of the resources that I've shared and I look forward to hearing about your questions. Thank you, Desiree. I appreciate the, the talk and it looks like we have uh, a number of curious people who have questions for you. So I will begin. Uh, uh, this uh, particular person uh, wants to know, uh, can you identify where the village was located on the other side of the river, more specifically, maybe as a follow-up? Um, so, Plebito, so we actually, I have on another slide that I actually deleted, um, there was a number of different spots and it hasn't been found because as far as I know that location is now under the freeway okay. and it's destroyed okay. oh dear so that's as much as i can tell you okay but you know um, we've done some layering of that map that i showed you over the, the you know top, current top topography and, and it's it's under the freeway okay uh are there tongva middens have you ever been have they ever been found sort of mounds of trash loss I mean, in Santa Monica or? Oh, I, I don't know, anywhere. Okay, so for those people that don't know what a midden is, usually in archeological terms, it, it's the remnants of like, uh, like trash. And so it will have, um, particularly in Tonga territory, it'll have shell, it'll have ash, it'll have pieces of bone, um, uh, anything that we kind of like throw away. So think about if you have a, a hearth and you're cooking, and then the hearth has tons of ashes because of all of the wood. You're shoveling out all of that stuff from the campfire and then putting it um, into another spot so that you can then, you know, make the fire bigger or something like that. Um, and then you'll throw away other stuff as well, tools that have broken and you can no longer fix and use anymore. Um, and in some instances, um, I wouldn't call them middens, but uh, you sometimes have burials associated with them, um, with ashes and stuff like that, but those are, are cremation and burials. But there's, I've found it in all over the place. Um, and if you look at that dark soil, you'll also see it'll be greasy, particularly on the coast because uh -huh. you have the fat from seals and other um, sea mammal life that we've cooked and it'll, it'll leach into the dirt and stuff like that. And I can't explain it to you other than it, it'll feel greasy and ashy. Thank you. Uh, do you speak the Gabrielino language? or has the Tongva created its own dialect in recent years? I personally only know a few words, and even then, I can't even speak English correctly and stumble <laughs> over the word. Um, and I've been trying to, but there is a Tongva language um, group that has been going on at least for 12, 13 years, again, led by Pamela Monroe um, with her generous help. And there are some recordings at the Smithsonian of songs from the Gabilano Tongva. And there are lots of word lists from various ethnographers, um, from Mary's uh, Seahart Merriam, from um, Harrington, et cetera. Um, but there's no associated real pronunciation. Depending on the ethnographer, they pronounce things differently. So um, Pamela has been helping us to kind of re-sound, re create, 
based on you know a lot of the the tribes that are related to us in terms of serrano loseno that we have more to draw from and trying to reconstitute that language but the language that we have is you know it's because of missionization we lost a lot of families lost that language uh, my own family um you know we went to um, 13 members of my family went to sherman um, institute which was a federal boarding school and they literally beat your oh, yeah. tradition out of you yeah. and so because of that trauma and those tragedies our communities many members of our community have lost that but because in terms of working with other researchers working with other community members from other tribes that have language um have maintained their language that are similar to us we're using those those sounds and using those understandings of that language to recreate our language now and we do have people that can say prayers we have people that are very um, fluent as much as they can be uh, which is great um, there is actually a community member who has two twin daughters and they've been growing up in the language and they've been wow. going to the language and so they're you know it's just phenomenal particularly when you're young and you start young they just they've got it now yeah the other the next two are kind of related uh one says which village do you descend from and the other says what Gabrielino family do you descend from? So most of my um, family is actually from the Whittier Narrows area. So there was um, both from the, um, there was a village and I can't pronounce the name of the village, but uh, Pertrero Chico and Pertrero Grande is where my family is from. Okay, okay. Uh, this is an interesting question. What can you tell us about Cogstone? The company or what a cogstone? What, do you, what does it do? Yeah, <laughs> in, a, in a nutshell. <laughs> so, so my company, um, which I'm president of, is a cultural resources firm, and what that means is that if there's any development in Los Angeles or actually anywhere in the world, we have laws that protect um, archaeological sites, paleontological sites, important historic sites, so sites that are over 50 years old. And you have to make sure before you affect them or possibly destroy them that you take into account their history and understand their history. And so they all, uh, a developer or a state agency, because we also have contracts with uh, the state of California as well as the federal agency, our federal agency, will contact us to do those assessments and to help them. Um, and, pr and we provide recommendations to the, the client on what to do if there happens to be an archaeological site within a particular area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going back. Uh, it says there, uh, did the Tonga fight for, for Spain, for the Mexicans, for the Americans? Um, I am assuming that question is kind of like thinking about all of the the, the, the people back east in which they were fighting in the Revolutionary War, either on the American side or on the British side and stuff like that. Um, I know particularly, I don't know. How's that? I'm just going to, I'm going to say that. I can make it up. I wouldn't doubt that there was alliances, particularly a lot of what happened during this both um during the spanish period as well as the mexican period and the american period you had all of these settlers from all these different countries marry in and you see a lot of these marriages um occurring between um you know all of these men and tongo women mm -hmm. and so a lot of it has to do with and because we I, as i explained we have these relationships through um marriage ties it is some instances was beneficial particularly with the changing of the history is that as a Tongva person, I would align myself with somebody that could possibly help me survive um, what's going on around me. And it was the same type of thing in relationship that we had with other people in other villages. So I wouldn't doubt that during the fights that there was various villages and people, Tongva people, fighting one way or another based on who they were related to and who they were married into. So that's my general assumption that there probably was but i actually don't know if okay. that's been documented. uh this uh uh guest is curious about the current dating on pimu catalina how is it resetting the timeline of tongva inhabitants and history 
so we actually did um, this. Um, that's one of the things that we've been working on. Um, so I'm one of the co-directors of the Pimu Catalina Island Archaeology Project, and the other co-director is Dr. Wendy Teeter, who is curator of the Fowler Museum at um, UCLA, as well as uh, Karima Kennedy Richardson, who is the staff archaeologist over at the Autry. And together, along with Cindy Elvitre, who is um, a member of the Gabilano community as well and has ties to Catalina. And so we've been working together to figure out how Catalina ties in with the general history that is known. Um, and one of the big questions for us has always been, you know, on the Northern Channel Islands, you have early settlement. You have Arlington man, um, or I should say Arlington person, because I don't like to say Arlington man, uh, <laughs> you know, an early date um, up there, you know, right at the cusp of the, the Pleistocene and the Holocene, and you don't get early dates on Catalina. And so we have been working to redate a lot of the collections um, that have been excavated from Catalina. We have a, a table. So the oldest date that we have there is about um, 6,000, and we're trying to push those dates um, because if you have early dates in the Northern Channel Island, you have to have later dates in Catalina. Um, but unfortunately, because of the way that Catalina was or wasn't excavated, most of the collections that we have in Catalina are actually looted. We don't have that um, control of, of having um, samples that we're able to date, um, but we're doing our best. Okay. Um, I think uh, I'll ask you one more question. Uh, this is from a, a, a viewer. Great talk. Thank you. He says, one of my favorite books is 1491, which summarizes the result of research over 30 or 40 years to figure out what the situation was in 1491. Just wondering, is there an estimate of the Tongva population in the area immediately pre-contact? Depends on who you talk to. So um, a lot of the early anthropologists, archaeologists always said that the whole state of California had 300,000 people and that um, at, at the time of, of, of contact. And a lot of that was based on um, estimates that they were seeing at the time that they started to record, but then also looking at the, um, the remnants of what was left at the various archeological sites. And, um, and that's also one of the things that we're trying to research on Catalina as well, is that a lot of people really put the population of Catalina really low. Um, anywhere between a thousand or, or, or less people on Catalina. And a lot of it is based on the various villages that have been excavated, one being in Avalon, the other being at Two Harbors, um, as well as Little Harbor. So there's three major villages that people have seen. But in our work, there's villages that have never been talked about and thought about. about. So depending on what model you're using in order to estimate the number of people at that particular area, the numbers range um, quite differently. So you now have, for instance, um, some people saying all of America's had 10 million people. So if you had 10 million people all over the Americas, then obviously California would have a higher population. Right. So that's my roundabout way of saying I don't know, and <laughs> it depends, which is, you know, that's what research is all about is that you know, you create the model and then, you know, based on the information you're provided you know, that you have it at the time and as new information comes in, then you, um, you know, change that. But definitely, you know, there was a lot more people here than, than has been previously commented on. Thank you. Desiree, your talk was obviously stimulating. We had a number, 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 a bumper crop of questions, uh, but I think, uh, they, that our guests can can visit the website that you mentioned, and uh, we appreciate you, and we appreciate the time that you've given for the for the for the project of San Monica Conservancy. And I will turn this back over to Tom Clay's. Thank you, Desiree. Extraordinarily fascinating. I think, particularly uh, when we're dealing with all our social injustice issues these days, uh, particularly highlighting them that you know, talking about our native people is extraordinarily important. 
I also want to thank everybody on the program committee for all the work they did to put to make this lecture possible, in particular Steve Loper, Libby Motika, and Allison Knight. Thank you very much. We couldn't do this work uh, and put these programs on without you. I want to thank, again thank Red Carr and Jim Jacobson for their sponsorship, making the lecture series possible. And please watch for our next lecture in this series, the time and top of, of which will be announced. Uh, if you liked what you heard, please share our lecture information with friends and family. And finally, please consider making a donation or joining the Conservancy as a member. Because of COVID and the events we can no longer conduct, we've lost 70% of our income. Your donation, at whatever level, will really make a big difference in supporting our important work. To learn more about what we do and join or make a donation, please go to www.smconservancy.org. Thank you.